like to call today's meeting of the Missoula Board of County Commissioners to order. I am joined today by Commissioners Slotnick and Vero. And we begin with a land acknowledgement, recognizing that this event today takes place in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. At this point, Violet, if you could display the colors. And if you could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Violet. And likely in the month of June, we'll start re, uh, reconvening these meetings in a uh, physical uh, setting in the Sophie Moise room in the courthouse. We'll still have the option for virtual participation, but at those hybrid meetings, we will actually have a real uh, physical flag and not just the virtual one, presumably. Okay, moving on. We have a proclamation to read today. This is Kids to <coughs> Hearts Day. Either Commissioner Vero or Slotnick, would one of you be interested in reading this? I think this? it's Josh's turn. I was struggling to look at both of these things simultaneously. I will, I will. Uh, well, oh, there, there it is. is on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> I could make it a wee bit bigger. <laughs> Let me do my best. It was I'll a try and put it. tiny kids to Parks Day. <laughs> oh, Maybe look. we'll just do it like this. <laughs> okay. And you can scroll it as I say it? Yes. All right. Well, here's our proclamation. Whereas May 15th, 2021 is the 11th Kids to Parks Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust held annually on the third Saturday of May and Whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit local parks, public lands and waters. And whereas we should encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle to combat issues of childhood obesity, diabetes, hypertension and hypercholesterol. And whereas Kids to Parks Day will broaden children's appreciation for nature and outdoors and Whereas Kids to Parks Day will recognize the importance of recreating responsibly while enjoying the benefits of the outdoors. And now, therefore, we, the Missoula Board of County Commissioners in the state of Montana, do hereby, hereby proclaim May 15th, 2021 as Kids to Parks Day. Fantastic. Thank and you. And it's going to be a beautiful <laughs> weekend. It is. Go to a park. With your kids <laughs> for the day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's at this point in the agenda where if folks who are participating from the public have any comments on items that are not on the agenda, uh, this is your opportunity to comment. Uh, you will see that we have a number of public hearings, five to be exact. If you're wanting to comment on those items, please hold your comments to that time. If not, if there's anything else within the scope of the Board of County Commissioners you'd like to comment on, do so now. If you're on the line via phone, unmute yourself and please uh, just pipe right in. If you're using your computer to access us, please use the raise hand function and I'll call on you in the order in which your hand goes up. Any public comment on items not on today's agenda? Okay, seeing none. Our claims list, and this is something that we do at all of our public meetings uh, to just tally up the claims that we have approved over the preceding period of time. And in this case, it's April 28th through May 5th. By the commissioner's office, total $1,015,579.48. I will uh, just make an announcement that I need to split here today for another meeting in about 45 minutes. So at that point, I will pass the torch to one of my colleagues to uh, round out the meeting and uh, chair the balance of the meeting. I'll let you guys uh, arm wrestle uh, virtually or whatever it takes to figure out who's going to do that. Juan, you want to do that? Sure. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. 
Juanita Vera will be the torchbearer. In the meantime, let's see what we can power through here. Our first public hearing, which I'll open, is re related to the uh, detention center intake resolution. And this is brought to us today by uh, Sheriff T.J. McDermott. Or Hello, everyone. It, it, this is Rob Taylor uh, representing the sheriff. So I kind of was left holding this bag, but I see Anna Conley's on here and I'm sure she can enlighten us all on uh, the proposed change here. Anna? Are you kidding me, Rob? <laughs> Not even a little bit. <laughs> well, I also see Commander Ziegler on the on the call, but um, generally I'll give you my background as far as I know. Um, my understanding is that last month there was a facilitated conversation with Judge Marks and it was between the detention center and um, the justices of the peace. The discussion let, was uh, trying to make sure that the jail population was um, a safe controlled population, that there wasn't a capacity issue and trying to make sure that people who might have um, warrants for failures to appear for nonviolent misdemeanors are not taking up jail time. Um, we had a resolution in place, as you know, for the last year to address some of the capacity issues surrounding uh, having a safe jail during COVID. And now we're looking to move forward um, in a non-COVID world and what jail population control looks like. Um, if you'd like, I can talk through the resolution. Uh, let me just pull it up really quick. <laughs> sure. Rob, you can talk while I pull it up. OK. Um to that end, we also had a uh, meeting with the local representatives of local law enforcement agencies and the uh, justices of, of the peace, as well as the municipal court judge representation and some district court representation about a program that they would collectively like to implement for these uh, failure to appear or what they're calling appearance warrants. So essentially, um, uh, it's a trackable program that Law enforcement officers, when they contact someone with a quote appearance warrant, um, they're able to give them an official notice to appear on that warrant, kind of a, a last and final second chance uh, on that arrest warrant or before it becomes an arrestable warrant and someone gets booked into jail for their failure to appear. So in other words, another chance and it gives us the opportunity, as Anna alluded to, to keep these nonviolent lower level misdemeanor offenders out of jail for relatively uh, small criminal violations and uh, give them one more chance to go see the judge on their own terms. And that implementation uh, or that went live on Monday of this week and uh, we have the forms. Uh, 911 is conducting the tracking based on our radio traffic with them and uh, all seems to be going pretty well on that front. Violet, could you pull up the resolution on the screen, please? I've got it here, Dave. OK, I was just thinking for other folks who are out there uh, viewing. Yep, I'm, I'm sharing it now. OK. Thanks, Anna. Do you guys see it? Yes. OK, so I think that the, the key differences between the resolution that was in place during COVID and this one are these two <coughs> here. Um, and I, I see that we have Justice Beal, so please feel free to expound on this. But um, basically, as Rob just mentioned, the justices of the peace and municipal court judge have agreed that they're going to specify on warrants whether they're directing law enforcement to take individuals to the detention center upon arrest or to the court to appear. Um, and if the, the judge directs in the warrant that the person is going to be taken to court, then law enforcement will not take that person to the detention center. And then the detention center will take all individuals sentenced there or brought there on a warrant that specifies that they are to be detained. If they have significant capacity concerns or there's a public health emergency, then they can decline intake of an individual brought to the detention center by an arresting officer on a new offense. And the new offense is as opposed to a warrant directing detention. Thanks, Anna. Judge Beal, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, you know, I think that's a really good summary. The only thing that uh, that I would add is that in addition to there being, you know, this this change in bringing people to court, uh, our our goal in many cases, and and what we've talked directly with the law enforcement agencies about, is 
the ability to not have to take anyone into any form of custody whatsoever, but just to give them a, a warning card uh, that has the contact information for whichever court it was, whether it was uh, municipal court, justice court, district court, and then uh, they would, you can see our beautiful ah, Hunter or, oh. uh, uh, cards that uh, should be very difficult to lose in your pocket um, or, or in a pile of paper. I was and, and line up. <laughs> Anna and I were fighting out in the, and we each got one. Yeah. Small, but yeah, was, yeah right. Judge Bill, you, you can expect <laughs> Commissioner Slotnick to appear by tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lost mine already, Rob. I don't know. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Anyway, that that's just the uh, additional part that I would add is is that the hope in in most cases is there won't even need to be an uh, you know arrest and and transport, but rather they'll just be this warning, and um, you know people will call us uh, the next day and everything will be wonderful. Thanks, Judge Beal. Uh, Cheryl Ziegler, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, just just one point, and and Judge Beal, you may want to weigh in on this one as well. But uh, we've we've had ongoing meetings between the detention center, the municipal court judges, and the justice court judges. Uh, this resolution talks about those meetings continuing. Uh, in our meeting this week, we talked about the need for those on an ongoing basis. And while we may not be doing those weekly anymore, um, as as agreed upon amongst the group, we are all going to be willing to be accessible and available if something comes up for those meetings to that they need to happen. So we are all agreeing to committing to those meetings as needed moving forward. Thank you, Cheryl, and thanks to everyone who's participated in this process to date. Uh, Judge Beal, was there something else you wanted to add? Uh, no, just the, the process has worked uh, so smoothly, frankly, between the, the jail and the judges and the lists uh, that we get of all that information. Really, the the point of the meeting was to, to get a handle on and to talk about people who were there, but were already uh, getting that information. So as as the expression goes, this could have been an email. Uh, we we have kind of turned that uh, that weekly meeting into an email. OK. Thanks. Before we take questions from the commission, is there any public comment on this resolution? Uh, if I could pipe in, this is uh, Jason Marks, and um, I just want to commend uh, the justices of the peace and uh, Judge Jinks with Municipal Court and the Sheriff for really working very collaboratively to solve what's been a long-standing problem of, you know, how do you get somebody to appear in court on a low-level offense when they don't come in when they're supposed to. Uh, I know that um, none of the judges want somebody arrested on their, you know, no valid driver's license ticket they got because the license expired. Uh, and they're maybe just not a very organized person in their lives. And um, I think this will really help solve those problems without, um, you know, issues of people getting booked into jail that really don't need to be there. So uh, that, that's my only comment is I, I really appreciate how well everyone worked together on this. Thanks, Judge Marks. It's a, an honor to have a district court judge in our presence. Uh, uh, this is rare. <laughs> yeah. Come again anytime. No, no joke. It is, a, it, is a, it is a big deal. Oh, Dave, here, I'm jumping the gun. Can I offer some comments? Uh, well, is there any other public comment out there? Any other district court judges? <laughs> Members they're they're the all listening in the conference here in Lewistown, so. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Okay, Josh. Thanks. I just want to commend everybody, as Judge Marks did, for all the cooperation. This was a really tough thing. This resolution we first passed in the heat of the pandemic, and it, it was difficult for everyone involved. And over time, the, the resolution also had to evolve. Everyone involved. Every, this had to evolve. And everybody did. People were rubbed a little bit. It was some chafing and we flexed and no one lost their temper and, and we got to a better place. So uh, everybody did right by the citizens of Missoula in getting to where we are right now, even though it was difficult. So thanks to all. Yeah, thanks, thanks for this great example. Yeah. All right, well. Um, um, the language what, is a little goofy on this. Can I just motion? Well, what's, what's the goofy language? What? Of the resolution or the motion? Either there's, I guess I'm maybe I'm in the wrong place. I'm looking at the RCA and it's just the. No, one. you're right. It's a little bit, I forgot to 
fix that up There's a little bit. There's some verbs that are missing. Yeah, if you just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, can I move to accept this resolution to address the intake of inmates at the detention center? Yes, so uh, <laughs> the motion is to uh, adopt the resolution. Uh, Josh, would you like to second the motion? I'm seconding that, absolutely. Okay, any further discussion on the motion to adopt the resolution? Seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, thank you everyone who played a role in this and we look forward to seeing it uh, implemented. Good work. Thank you. Thanks everyone. You bet. Thanks. Okay, our next public hearing, which I will open, is going to be introduced by Deb Bell, uh, Assistant Director of Public Works. This is a resolution to adopt the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code. Yes, good morning, or good afternoon, rather. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm sorry I'm on the phone this afternoon with you folks, and uh, but my internet seems to be a bit more dodgy today than normal. Um, so before you today is a resolution adopting the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code and um, the Building Codes Bureau of the State of Montana Labor and Industry notified local jurisdictions of this adopted code um, back in February 13th of 2021 and according to state law uh, certified local jurisdictions which Missoula County is we uh, may adopt those building codes as adopted and amended by the Bureau. Um, we are given 90 days to do so, and we are right at the 90 day mark today. Um, Missoula County is a certified Bureau, and we are going to adopt, we need to adopt these and enforce these codes. Um, these codes provide minimum standards to protect life, limb, property, and public welfare. And just to give a, a brief overview of what's in the code to, that's changing, um, a lot of it is language cleanup, um, definition cleanup, um, things that have to do with insulation and fenestration requirements by components, um, equivalent to U factors, um, and then just some cleanup language and, and ceilings without attics and crawl space walls. So it's basic language cleanup. Um, it won't really be affecting too much stuff. At this point, we are not adopting Appendix RA solar ready provisions for detached one and two family dwellings and townhomes, um, but we do have the option to adopt that at any point thereafter, and we wanted to do a bit more public outreach on that and get some more input before we adopted that. So that will be coming at a later date, um, but that is the resolution before you today. Thank you, yeah. All right. Just yeah. Hang on there and we might have questions for you. Uh, before we do though, is there any public comment on the resolution to adopt the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code? Any public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing and open it up for questions from the commission. Any questions? No, this was a pretty straightforward yeah. piece and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting more feedback on the solar ready um, yes definitely deb i'm looking forward to the solar one hope it comes soon sounds good okay. do my best okay someone like to make a motion um i would move that we adopt the 2018 international energy conservation code second i could not have said that better myself josh <laughs> well said <laughs> Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you all. Next, we roll into three consecutive family transfers, and uh, we will have Nick with our Community and Planning Services introduce each of these to us. Nick. Thank you, Dave. Um, let me share my screen here, get my uh, staff PowerPoint going, then we'll get started. So this first one is a proposal by uh, John and Sally Roski to use the family transfer exemption to the Montana Sub Subdivision and Planning Act. Starting with the background, uh, this project is located on the north side of I-90, approximately a quarter mile south of the Tura exit on Highway 10 East. It is unzoned 
and the growth policy that uh, guides this area is the two, 2002 Regional Land Use Guide. Uh, that guide designates this area as residential with a proposed density of two dwellings per one acre. And it is also within the Tura Activity Circle. Getting into current uh, on-site conditions, uh, the property is 2.46 acres in size. Uh, current density is one dwelling per 2.46 acres. Existing on-site conditions include one home occupied by the claimants, John and Sally, and uh, there's also one shop building on the site. The tract was originally created in 1996 by a member of the Roski uh, family using the family transfer exemption, and that could be seen in uh, CRS 4607. Getting into the Roski's proposal, um, the claimant's adult son Jacob would receive a one acre track proposed as track B2, that is the track uh, in yellow to the north. Uh, the claimant's John and Sally would retain ownership of the remaining 1.46 acres proposed as track B1. This does include the home and shop. Um, with this proposal, the new recommended, so the new density would be one dwelling per 1.23 acres which is compliant with the 2002 regional guide. And, it, and the application does state that all tracks are intended to remain for single family residential. Uh, this app was sent out to Missoula County agencies for comment. Uh, the only comment received was from the clerk and recorder's office, which mentioned a track of record in the southern corner of the property that did not affect the proposed family transfer. Uh, and it is not recommended that this track could be used for a, a BLR. As with any family transfer, we check for rebuttable pr presumptions and general evasion criteria. So I'm going to go over those points that were triggered during staff analysis. Rebuttable presumption number eight was triggered, and this is found applicable. As previously mentioned, the Roski family created the parent track in 1997 using the family transfer exemption as seen in CUS 4607. General evasion number four is applicable. Um, the, Roski, the Roski edition was an 11 lot major subdivision filed in 1980, but it was vacated in 1986 uh, by the Missoula County Commissioners, meaning that it, the project never went through. And then general evasion criteria number five, has the claimant engaged in any prior exempt transactions involving this track? This is also applicable. Um, in 05, there was a boundary line relocation utilized, and that's seen in COS 5661. Now I'm going to go over the family transfer questions with the um, claimant. Do we have John and Sally on the line here? Uh, yes, John's here. Awesome, thank you, John. Uh, can I please ask you to state your name for the record? Uh, John Bradford Roski. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? Uh, no. Second question, do you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? No. Number three, have you talked to anyone at the county about going through subdivision review? Uh, no. Thank you. Um, the recipient is not a minor, so we will skip questions four and five. In conclusion, uh, based on staff analysis, CAPS is recommending an approval of the pros family transfer. Um, and I'll now turn it back over to you, commissioners, for questions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Mr. Roski, is there anything else you'd like to add at this point? Uh, no, it's. Uh we originally picked the piece up just to kind of keep people from building next to us, but uh, uh, our son probably falls into a little bit different category. So uh, that's, we thought it'd be a great, great way to uh, have them close to us still. It's always great when your children fall into that category of wanting them close. So that that's a good thing. <laughs> And it was it was my grandparents' property too, so it's really nice that everything's staying in the family, or at least a chunk of it. So. Sure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Roski. Is there any public comment on the proposed family transfer? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Any questions from the commission on this? No, it's hey, refreshing when it's compliant with uh, growth policy. Thanks, Juan. I was going to say the same thing. Seems uh basically clean easy okay well then uh, how about an easy motion 
I motion to approve the Roski family transfer. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Roski. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Okay, Nick, uh, and I should add, uh, I mistakenly said that we had three family transfers today. It, it looks like the uh, Burdon family transfer is uh, is going to be taken off the agenda today and uh, postponed or delayed in some fashion. So we will not be taking that one up. All right, Nick. Correct. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So the next family transfer is the Ramos family transfer. This is a proposal by Mark Ramos to use the family transfer exemption to the Montana S Subdivision and Platting Act. Starting with the background, uh, the location of the proposed transfer is approximately five miles south of Arlie in northern Missoula County. Parcel 6 is approximately uh, 0.5 miles to the east of Highway 93 North and is fully within the Flathead Reservation boundaries. Uh, the property is currently unzoned. The growth plan that covers this area is also the 2002 Regional Plan Use Guide. Uh, it designates this area as open and resource with a recommended density of one dwelling per 40 acres. Oops, sorry about that. Had that. There we go. OK, we're back um, getting into existing conditions here. Uh, the property is 10.06 acres in size and currently undeveloped. Uh, current resi residential density, if developed with one uh, structure, would be one dwelling per 10.06 acres. The claimant, Mike Romnus, also owns an adjacent lot to the post family transfer. Uh, this this lot has one permit issued for a barn with dwelling space and has another uh, permit for a shop with dwelling space that is currently being reviewed. Getting into the family transfer proposal, uh, the claimant's adult son Tyler would receive uh, the 5.02 acre track proposes 1B, that's the one to the north, and then the claimant Mike Romnus would retain ownership of the remaining 5.04 acres proposes track 1. We, we did receive a letter from Mike Romnus post staff report indicating that uh, track 1A could be transferred in the future to a uh, an another son, so I wanted to point that out since it was a post uh, staff report. Um, the proposed family transfer would exceed the recommended density of the two, two, 2002 guide um, with a proposed density of one dwelling per 5.03 acres. And then all um, the application states that all tracks are intended to remain intended to remain residential. The application was sent out to Missoula County agencies as well as the CSKT for comment. Uh, the health department provided standard comment about uh, the project needing sanitation review. Public comment wanted, sorry, public works wanted uh, it to be relayed that these properties would be uh, re required to, to gain access off of Tool Valley Road. And then we did receive comment from the CSKT wildlife biologist that did indicate that um, the project would not affect any wildlife habitat, whether that be endangered species, federally listed endangered, threatened, or candidate species. And as with any family transfer proposal, uh, we check for rebuttable presumptions and general evasion criteria points, and I will go over any points that were triggered during staff analysis. Rebuttable presumption number four, this is at, found to be applicable. Um, Mike and Wendy Ramos own the adjacent uh, parcel, parcel three of COS 6132 to the proposed family transfer parcel, which is parcel one of COS 6132. Um, like I said before, permit records indicate that there is a barn with living quarters on parcel three, and additionally, um, a shop with living quarters also being permitted on parcel three. The family transfer recipient could receive parcel one via warranty deed or quick claim deed, essentially achieving the goal of the family transfer without the division of parcel one. Rebuttal presumption number eight, the, um, this is applicable. Uh, this track was created using the family transfer exemption, uh, although it should be noted that this was not done by a member of the Ramos family. And that exemption can be seen in uh, COS 6132. General evasion criteria number one this is found to be applicable. Uh, while it's not believed that the applicant is solely in the business of land development, Ms. Ramos did, did perform a two-lot minor subdivision in 2007 referred to as the Ramos edition. 
general vision criteria point number two was the original track transferred to the claimant within the past two years. Uh, this is also applicable. Um, my, Mike and Wendy Ramos purchased the property uh, via warranty deed on November 30th of 2020. General evasion uh, point number 14 this is also applicable. Uh, the, the, the proposed family transfer would exceed the rec recommended density at one dwelling per 5.03 acres. And last, uh, general vision criteria point number 19, the information at, and exhibits provided by the claimers show that the proposal for a family transfer exemption does not comply with the requirements established in the subdivision regs for the use of this exemption. So now I will go over the family transfer questions. Um, the claimant, do we have Mike Ramos on the line here? Yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, can I please ask you to set your name for record? Um, Michael Anthony Ramos. Thank you. Uh, question number one, did you buy the property with the intent of dividing it? Yes, we did actually. Thank you. Question number two, did you or your transferees intend to transfer the property within the next year? No. Thank you. Number three, have you talked to anyone at the county about going through su subdivision review before? We have not. Thank you. And then um, because the recipient is not a minor, we will skip questions four and five. In conclusion, uh, CAPS is recommending denial of the proposed family transfer based off of a staff analysis. And I will turn it back to you, Commissioners. Thank you, Nick. Mr. Ramos, is there anything else that you'd add, like to add at this time? Well, I think you guys have read my letter and that's that's kind of my story. I'm trying to bring my one son back and possibly two sons back to Montana um, to try and, you know, they left because they couldn't seek employment. Um, they're both college educated. And my oldest son wants to come back uh, to Montana, and I thought this is a great way to get him back here. He also wants to take over the family business, and we have a eight-year plan to implement that. Um, uh, I own Paul's Pancake Parlor, and I really want to keep it in the family, and it's, it's imperative that I have him back here in, in order to do that, uh, or I'll end up selling it, I imagine. And I, I don't really want to do that. I want to I want to try and keep that in the family. It's, uh, I mean, it's been in the family for so long. So that's kind of the general idea. Uh, we tried to do this um, back in 2007, and then the bubble kind of hit in 2008 with the uh, with the piece of property that we subdivided uh, that was referenced earlier. Um, subsequently, we had to sell that piece of property. So I, I have an opportunity again, you know, some you know quite a few years later to do this and so this is my plan thank you mr ramos is there any public comment on this proposed family transfer i i think did mr ramos get cut off uh, i'm here oh okay i, I thought i, think I thought you, you were uh, sorry okay thanks any uh, public comment on the proposed family transfer Commissioner Strohmeyer, this is Dan Coles with IMAG, but I helped Mike put this application together as their surveyor and consultant for the sanitation stuff. Um, I just want to thank Nick for, even though I don't agree with their recommendation, um, he did a good job helping us out through the process and kind of getting this uh, a pretty expedited review for it. Um, unfortunately, I think you guys will speak about it, but it, it, this doesn't match the growth policy. But I think if you look at the small neighborhood in this area, you'll see quite a bit of density. Um, and one thing Mike didn't touch on that <clears throat> Nick did was about the development of the lot next door. And Mike and his wife have kind of been looking for their you know dream property in Forever Home, and uh, and that's what they're building over across the road. So yeah, and we're we're actually done with the barn with living quarters and. Um, the shop with living quarters is <laughs> maybe a little bit of a dream given the, the cost of building right now. So um, we do have a, we, we actually just moved into that property. So we are there and so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. Uh, thanks, Dan. Any other comment, public comment? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Questions from the commission? 
Yeah, I've, I've I have a one. question for. Oh, oh go it, ahead, Juan. I'll, no, I'll go after you. No, no, no go ahead. I, I bet my question is probably the same as yours. So. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. So mine's a question for Nick. Uh, Nick, you you said that uh, the same outcome could be achieved for the Ramos family via warranty deed or quit claim deed. Could you describe what those two mechanisms are? Yeah, it would just be a transfer of land without the needed division. So it could be uh, a sale for $1 or whatever amount would be agreed upon just to uh, transfer the uh, title of ownership to his adult son. And if you were to do that, what would the process be in terms of local government? Uh, there would be, he'd have to go through the clerk and recorder's office to get it recorded officially, but there would be no review for it. Okay, so no review. Correct. So why, so why not do yeah, that? Mr. Ramos, would you like to address that? Why not just uh, transfer parcel one in its entirety to uh, your son? You know, we, have, we haven't actually talked about that. Okay. <laughs> well, and I don't, this is Dan Fultz again. I don't know if you're, if you're understanding your question, but what, what Nick is saying is instead of doing a division, it, right. to, to it would it just be to transfer the entire 10 acres to him. Right. Yeah. I well, that. yeah, well, I guess the other part of that would be that um, down the road, we would possibly like to bring back uh, Ryan, which, which is my, my younger son, um, and then we would actually have two parcels to do that. Well, here's here's a question just to push this a little bit farther. Uh, uh, in terms of family transfers, and, and I, I guess this would be a, a little bit speculative based on how good your kids get along with one another but would it be possible for uh one of their siblings at a later date to do a family transfer to his brother that's a possibility i'm kind of feeling like we should pause this or or let you guys have a chance to talk about this and think about this and not I, i'm not sure i want to make a decision today if you guys want to because if, if, I, if I'm understanding this right, you could uh, you could do the warranty date or quit claim deed without any review, and then you wouldn't be bumping up against this uh, that your density is not in in alignment with uh, the growth documents. Oh right. dear! No, John, John John Hart is there. Okay, uh, Deputy yeah. County Attorney John Hart. Yeah, this, this is John Hart from the county attorney's office, uh, the bearer of bad news. So a family transfer requires a transfer uh, to an immediate family member. And the definition, the statutory definition of an immediate family member does not include one's siblings. Oh. It's your, your children, your spouse, or your parents. So, um, so that, uh, that particular scenario wouldn't pan out. Good to know. And they can't uh, do a transfer to both their sons. Not on that particular piece, because it, it you know tract one is is in an undivided ownership by Mr. Ramos. He he needs to retain um, a portion of it. The only way they could do that is to split it into three parcels. And I don't know if that 10 acre tract, you know, lends itself to to splitting into three tracks. And that way, Mr. Ramos could keep one and then deed the other two to his adult sons, one of which is apparently coming back shortly and the other uh, will come back in, hopefully in the future. So uh, just to throw out another option, uh, could he could Mr. Ramos quit claim deed the entire land to both boys? Both of them have are, are, are kind of tenants in common on this 10 acre piece. And then between the two of them, they can figure out how they want to split it up. That is, that is a possibility. He could uh, he could deed the property to his sons as co-tenants. Mm -hmm. um, and but then they would each have an undivided ownership interest right. in the land, which, you know, uh, is is something that they would have to. Uh, Yep. you know, have to deal with in the yep. future. Ho exactly. Hopefully, they're uh, hopefully they're they're blood brothers and uh, would would never have an issue with that. Absolutely, and in the sh but in the relative short term, 
the goal of having property to get uh, elder son back would be achieved and it wouldn't be subject to review, which could end up in denial as Nick was recommending. I think you're right, Commissioner Slotnick, unless, you know, there could be something that I'm not thinking about, but I, but I think that's a correct analysis. That may get you where you want to go, Mr. Ramos. Hey, this is Dan with iBank. Can, can I just interject something right here real quick? Um, the idea of co-ownership from, you know, I see when we're assisting people with building and things, it can be really hard to get financing because of that. So if Tyler wants to build his home in the next couple of years and his other son is not ready to build a home or financially because both people are on the title of the land. There, I mean, there's all kinds of implications on that tax implication. I mean, that's pretty hard, hard to achieve. I think. I mean, in in to order to to have two buildable lots for his sons, he would have to. The only option to to, to get two parcels would be to do a, a full subdivision review. I just thought I, I would, I, would yeah, I, I just gotta say, I get that it's, it's complicated to have co-tenants and financing, but I've been involved with one of these things recently and we were able to get it done. It didn't seem like moving mountains. So the other option and, uh, and well, there's a few options before us, I guess today. Uh, one, I, I would love to hear if you have more thoughts, Mr. Ramos on the thought of just, uh, quick claim deed conveyance to your son Tyler for the entire tract. Uh, procedurally, we could uh, not take action today and allow you some more time to think about that. Uh, we could take action today knowing that the staff recommendation is denial and uh, and you would get a thumbs up or thumbs down today, but uh, the outcome may be somewhat uh, in question at this point. I, I think, well, I would rather Mr. Ramos talk this over with his sons and um, it sounds like there needs to be more conversations. I, I, I don't know the relationship there and I, so I don't want to force uh, force a situation that the family doesn't want. And I and I think maybe what part of what you're sensing uh, from us, Mr. Ramos, is that we have seen this comes out of a, a history of family transfers where there is uh, uh, there might be every intent that uh, both of your sons will eventually reside on on the property, but we've seen too many instances where uh, good intentions have ended up with a, a parcel or multiple parcels uh, uh, not ending up with the intended. Um, recipient and and simply being sold or developed in other ways. So I think that's the impetus behind how to achieve your goals to get your son up here, your son Tyler up here uh, and avoid the cloud of uncertainty with whether your second son will actually end up residing on the other piece of land. You know, I I understand the proposal that's in front of me as far as um, it's just not the way that I wanted to do it. I, I didn't want it to be complicated between those two for sure. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put it in both their names. I, I just don't. Yeah, and then there's the option though of putting it in the elder son's name and they figure it out. At a later date, if and if and when your other second son wants to. And as, as Juanita is saying, we've kind of hit pause and give you guys a chance to talk through it. Yeah, maybe we could do that. So would that, would that be a potential, I guess, maybe that's a question for Nick um, to get um, on next month's uh, County Commissioner hearing? Like schedule wise, I'm just asking for that being pushed out to next month then. Yeah, we could uh, yeah. definitely look at the calendar. I know uh, it is filling up ish, but I know I think there's maybe one date in early June that we can probably slide it on in. in on I think June June tenth still has room, June 10th. Nick. I think that would be one of the only ones in June that would work. Yeah. It, 
and just about a month. So if, if you guys decide you want to go a different route than to attempt to do family transfer, you don't have to any review. You don't have to get scheduled on a meeting. I think it's good to schedule it just in case, but you may not need that. Would that work for you, Mr. Ramos? We'll we'll schedule schedule you for a follow up continuance of the public hearing until June tenth, and uh, and between now and then, talk amongst yourselves or confer with staff, and we'll figure out uh, whether we'll need to get you on the agenda that or actually have you that day for the meeting. Yep, we can do that. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, if if you end up giving it to Tyler, we don't have to be involved in this at all. So you have you have options. Yeah, no review, no decisions. No commissioners. <laughs> no commissioners. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for your flexibility. I think this will uh, give everyone some time to consider options further. So we appreciate you joining us, Mr. Uh, Ramos and Mr. Fultz. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. OK, well, shockingly, uh, without that final family transfer, we are out of agenda items today, so uh, there will be no, no torch to pass, apparently. Is there <laughs> any other business to come before the commission? That was great. Thank you. OK, seeing none, we'll be adjourned. OK, right, thank you. Bye. Bye.